Hello, welcome to the House of Wellness. I'm Luke Darcy and it's always good to be sitting alongside my good friend Joe Stanley. Welcome, Joe. Darcy, now I love being here with you. And can you believe it's already halfway through the year? And if you've been shivering lately, then get ready for the winter solstice 2022. The shortest day and the longest night returns on June 21st. So, Joe, when you say shortest day of the year, we're actually talking about the number of daylight hours. So, on the 21st of June, we'll see the least amount of daylight hours in 24 hours. And when you work out the numbers, it's around four and a half hours less than the longest day of the year in December, which is my favourite day of the year. <laughs> I love that long day in December because it is so cold at this time of year and I have really bad circulation. So my fingers, like, I can't feel them half the time. So give me the summer solstice any day. Well, someone who I think shares that very similar <laughs> sentiment is Jackie Felgate. You're more of a summer girl, Jack, I believe. Indeed, indeed. I cannot stand winter. The only good thing about winter is the footy. Yeah, true. That's <laughs> right. When your team wins. <laughs> That's true. It's pretty cold at the G when your team is losing, that is for sure. Indeed. Good news, though, for the lucky people living in the Northern Hemisphere. They'll be sunning through the longest day of the year at exactly the same time. We'll be shivering through our shortest. So, Jackie, tell us what have you got this week in the world of health? Das, it's all about the heart. Around 100 Australians receive heart transplants each year. They have to undergo several heavy-duty tests to monitor for organ rejection. It's uncomfortable, it's time-consuming and it carries some risk. Now scientists at the Victor Chang Cardiac Research Institute and Sydney's St Vincent's Hospital have pioneered a virtual biopsy to test for organ rejection. The new MRI technique is non-invasive and has been shown to be safe, effective and reduces the risk of complications. The revolutionary technology is now expected to be adopted at clinics around the world. Meanwhile, in another Australian first, women in New South Wales who are undergoing IVF are set to receive up to $2,000 to help fund their treatments. The cash rebate is being offered by the state government to help thousands of women fulfil their dream of having a baby. Women who've undergone an eligible procedure from the 1st of October this year will be able to submit a claim when the rebate scheme opens in January 2023. And it's hoped the scheme will pave the way for other states and territories to follow, Joe. I just think this is really wonderful, although we need to kind of look at it in real terms because every IVF cycle costs up to about $10,000 and it's very unlikely for your first cycle to actually be successful. So most couples end up going through many, many treatments and so $2,000 is, feels a little bit like a drop in the ocean, but any kind of assistance obviously is helpful. And also the great thing is it's acknowledging that real burden that it is for these you know, women and men who want to have babies. So I think it's really wonderful that it's actually been acknowledged by the government. And 18,000 women will benefit from this one. So let's hope that it's rolled out right across the other states and territories. And finally, something that's close to all of our hearts, and that's footy. History was made at Darwin's TIO Stadium recently when a veteran First Nations broadcaster became the first woman to commentate an AFL match in Indigenous language. Sylvia Nulpindich called the Gold Coast Hawthorne game as part of Sir Doug Nicholls' round. She was joined by two male Yolngu commentators and it was broadcast across North East Arnhem Land. And Darcy, this is really an important step in the AFL's fight against racism. Jackie, I had the great uh, pleasure of meeting yeah. Sylvie and her two co-commentators, Bakali and William, and to listen to them broadcast in their native uh, Yolngu uh, dialect is just quite something special. They travelled to Dreamtime, the MCG, 3,000 kilometre trip down to see the smiles on their face, uh, I think the Dreamtime experience, and now having East Arnhem Land female Indigenous commentators is just a, a brilliant thing to see. Yeah, we love to see it, don't we, Darcy? And this year's Sir Doug Nicholls round marks 30 years since the Mabo decision was handed down by the High Court, which acknowledged First Nations land rights. So a truly momentous year. We forget history, don't we, Joe? That 30-year decision that really, for the first time, acknowledged the Indigenous ownership of the land uh, here in Australia. So it is great that we are getting a very much-needed history lesson on that front. Thanks, Jackie. Informative as always. And up next, how decluttering your home can also be a makeover for your mental health. We're cleaning out our cupboards right after this.
If the pandemic gave us one upside for me, Joe, it was making us assess what's actually important and valuable in life. And the way that applies to me is our work, our life, our health and our families, but also all the physical stuff, Joe, that we surround ourselves with. Well, pretty much everyone I know, including me, used the forced time at home to go through cupboards and storage boxes and, for us, the roof, <laughs> and do a clean-out of areas that had just gone unt untouched for years. I love a good clean-out, Joe. It makes me feel, you know, like I've got more mental energy when you have the house sort of tidy and clean and all that clutter is no longer there with us. And a report by online marketplace Gumtree found that the average Aussie has 20 to 25 unwanted items lying around. Is that there. all? <laughs> You'd be happy with that. <laughs> and the good part is they're worth more than an estimated $5,000. So getting rid of your junk isn't just good for your soul, Joe. It can be good for the bank balance as well. Well, do you know, the thing is, if you've had children in your life, in your house, that means I think you've got often baby toys, baby clothes, baby furniture, that's the start. And then as they get older, you just gather all of this stuff. Surely that's not worth $5,000. Maybe not the baby toys, Joe, <laughs> but there'd probably be a few items floating around that yes. are recyclable and it's a huge economy now, the ability to be able to get rid of the things mm. and also the, the joy of donating something that you love don't need as well. I love that something might have another life somewhere else. And even before the pandemic, a declutter revolution was taking place Japanese author and TV star Mari Kondo instructed us to only keep things that spark joy and a stack of TV shows, books and websites encouraged us to lose all the material items collecting dust and weighing us down because it turns out that cleaning out our cupboards also gives us the space to go with the flow at home and in life. All right, Julie, come in. This is my wardrobe. Awesome. <laughs> it's been a little while. Yep, yep. <laughs> Laura Shepherd's wardrobe is packed to the rafters. There's no space left and she has no idea how to fix it. It's been a long time coming for me. It's probably been about 10 years since I've actually done my own wardrobe and it's something that I keep putting off. Everything is sort of up for grabs, <laughs> which awesome. is, I'm sure, nice and easy. Unable to sort it on her own, Laura's got decluttering expert Julie Whiting on board to guide her through the mammoth task of cleaning up and clearing out. I think when I was um, coming into today and, and preparing for Julie to come, I did a lot of mental preparation about um, wanting to be clear of my clutter. Like my wardrobe sits on the end of my bed and I look at it if it's left open just a little bit and everything's falling out of it. And I just, I find it really overwhelming. Often we value these items as, you know, could be handy one day, but we forget how valuable our space is. Like how expensive is real estate in Melbourne or anywhere in Australia? And storage is expensive, whether you're renting an offsite or using your own place. The biggest struggle in decluttering is what to keep and what to let go. Both stressful decisions for many people confronted with lots of stuff. So we're going to just make categories now. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go, um, you know, dresses, tops, pants, keep them all separate so that we can look at what you've got and get some clarity around that. People get really exhausted decluttering because they get decision fatigue. So it's, it's, it's like a mental fatigue more than a physical fatigue of just deciding on every little thing and a few hours of that and people are just done and often they've made a huge mess, they've sprawled everything out and they still haven't finished, the place looks messier than when they started and they just think, oh, I'm never doing this again. But the mess is just the start. Letting go of clothing that was expensive is particularly tough and Laura, like most people, expects their second-hand items are worth selling. There are just so many clothes in the world yeah and you know people like to shop online things are cheap now unfortunately the online secondhand space is a little bit tricky so i would say just donate unless it's super designer i'm happy getting rid of things but then when i think about oh where's it going how much money has been wasted a lot of people struggle with doing the right thing with their stuff because they've paid money for it and they don't want to see it going into landfill which is you're totally understandable. So just knowing there are lots of different charities that do different things and a lot of people, they're not across all of that and they just want to know, they want to do the right thing and they don't know how to go about it. 
I had this dress in orange, like a burnt orange, and my girlfriend borrowed it and never got returned. And I think about it often. So oh, even though you? you say that sometimes you forget about it. But do you know what? If you had it, maybe you wouldn't even wear it. Or maybe think, you would. I don't know. I don't think I'd wear it. <laughs> maybe you're just dirty. But it's one can. of those things I've never been able to find a replacement. And in my head, it's probably better than what it was. She said she gave it to someone else, and then they gave it to someone else. Oh! It's there! What? <laughs> You didn't even know that you still... <laughs> Look, it was a bit of a, um, a running joke, that orange dress for my girlfriends and I. And I think the thing is, is I always had in my head that this item was so much more important than what it was. Oh, I don't even like it anymore. Gosh, I don't <laughs> like all that. I mean, I like it. It's beautiful. It. Yep. But it's... I would would never wear it. Could you imagine me in a halter neck now? <laughs> My golly gosh, no way. And I'm so happy to have it gone now. <laughs> and I apologise to all of my friends. <laughs> the dilemma we all face tossing out some things is that they hold sentimental value. A lot of our things that we struggle to get rid of, it can be for aspirational reasons, like we think that one day we will be that size again or in that stage of life again. And letting go of the item sometimes represents letting go of the memory or of the time. And it's great to try and find other ways to, to hold on to the memory, like I said to Laura with um, one of her dresses. Like, it's awesome that she's got photographs of her wearing that dress and that's maybe enough. Because you said you were right-handed, we've put the frequent use items to the right because you said you love to layer and tuck on a frock, jeans, and then the lesser used, used items, include, including your sentimental garments, are far left. Um, but see how you go. Like, if you're using something more, you can just move it to the high frequency side. For me, I'm really mindful of what I let in. Before I buy something, I want to be sure that I definitely need it, that I definitely have a foreseeable use for it, not just a, it's pretty and I might use it one day. Have a concrete idea of where, it, where it's gonna live. Do you have a spot for it? And if you do, is there something that you can release to someone else that it will be replacing? So it's like a bit of a one in, one out policy to avoid that build up of clutter. It was very difficult getting rid of everything, but I think now I'm left with things that I really enjoy. Oh, I just feel amazing. This is so great. What Julie's done is just wonderful. I'm really happy with the time that she's put in and that now I've got a whole new wardrobe to work with that's just so much more freeing. I can see what I've got. It's just wonderful. It's really great. The circular or second-hand economy is estimated to be worth a staggering $48 billion, Joe. So there is a really good financial incentive for people to get around to selling the stuff they don't need. It's also a great chance to refresh your state of mind, as we just saw. The woman who helped Laura declutter her home and her way of life is Australia's Queen of Clean, Julie Whiting. Welcome, Julie. Hi, Joe. Uh, I'm feeling a little judged right now because my house is full of, <laughs> full of junk, right? But mostly I'm guilty of having a lot of clothes. So I know I keep things because I have an emotional connection with it. But why do you see people keep things and objects and stuff? <laughs> there are a lot of reasons, Jo. Um, sometimes it's just... Well, a lot of the time it's just deferred decisions. Decisions that have not been made and the stuff is kept because people just don't know what to do with it. Can I donate it? Can I sell it? You know, should I give it back to mum? Too hard, let's just put it back in the cupboard. That's probably the main reason. Julie, do you find it starts with, you know, I just keep that item because you know, I'm not sure I may use it down the track and then it snowballs and suddenly you've got all this clutter around your house. Is that your experience? Yeah, I think there is a big fear of making the wrong decision, of getting rid of something and then needing it later or getting rid of it and missing it. And people fear, like, missing something as though that's the worst thing that can happen in life. So if I wanted to declutter a space, where do I start? So let's just pretend it's your pantry. Take that's everything probably out. not pretending. That would be, <laughs> that would be accurate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a good spot, spot to start. So you take it all out, pop it all maybe on your kitchen bench or on the floor. And then look at what's on your kitchen bench and categorise it. So you've got your baking stuff, um, spices, maybe your pasta and rice, you know, your carbs. And then 
put everything back in in its categories, but also being mindful of access points. So if you access a certain category a lot, then that'll be between hip to shoulder, where you can just grab it quickly. Things you don't use very often, like if you're not a baker, you might put your baking stuff up really high. So it's mainly about categorising, assigning zones, and thinking about frequency of use and access points. Well, Julie, you've inspired me to go home and want to have a big clean-up immediately. It always feels good, doesn't it, Joe, when you yes. get everything sorted? And uh, thanks for coming in, Julie. We really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. After the break, a new global study is underway to help kids who stutter. We'll let Aussie families know how they can be part of it. That's coming up next on The House of Wellness. Now, Joe and Jack, it's fair to say I think all three of us have the gift of the gap. It's <laughs> probably why we're working in TV and radio and sitting here right now. But for some people, the ability to get their words out doesn't always come easy. Have you guys experienced that? The great fear of public speaking is mm, almost yeah. the top of the list for a lot of people, isn't it? Absolutely. And one of the things with public speaking, I think, is you can't get good at it until you actually do it. Mm. So it's not something you can practise until you're in front of a crowd and then you can end up in a lot of trouble. Yes, that's absolutely right. Would you say, though, it came naturally for you? I've, it's, for me, been a lot of practice and learning classes and drama and comedy and all that sort of stuff that allowed me to sort of get that confidence to get on the stage. I still pinch myself that I get to get paid to talk for a living. <laughs> like, You're very good at it. Yeah. I love talking. <laughs> My best mate in school has ended up becoming an outstanding lawyer and he uh, encouraged us to join the school debating team, which I never would have done. <laughs> he wrote all of the uh, uh, speeches for us and it was brilliant. <laughs> But it gave practice at a young age, I think, definitely helped, for sure. Well, speech and communication disorders are really common, especially in kids. They include mispronouncing words, lisping or stuttering. And while the majority of young kids can grow out of these things naturally, when they continue into adolescence and beyond, the impact can, of course, be life-affecting. Kids develop at different rates, of course, particularly in terms of language, literacy and communication. But kids can also be really cruel and a speech impairment like stuttering can lead to teasing, social difficulties and anxiety for the person who stutters. Yeah, the exact cause of stuttering remains unknown, which is why 3,000 Australian stutterers are being recruited to take part in a major international study. What does it look like? Big one. Yeah. And... I don't remember much about having a stutter. I remember the feeling of it feeling quite like blocked and stuck like on my chest. Yeah. But, but, but. Daisy was about four when she started to stutter. She'd try to wait for it to pass. You know, she'd often say the beginning of a word up to 15 times and then look down at her feet very self-consciously. Even at four, it was affecting her confidence and her willingness to go and speak to strangers or ask for something, and that was really hard. And I think, as a mother, I felt very guilty. Daisy is now 17 and hasn't let her diagnosis define her. She's a keen public speaker and state debating finalist. With the help of early intervention and speech therapy, her stutter is a distant memory. When I'm a bit tired or a bit nervous, I sometimes stutter and I can feel the kind of block in my chest like I felt when I was little. But I think because of the therapy, it's not a problem at all today. And I feel very confident speaking, especially like in front of people and stuff like that, which I think is really important. And I'm really grateful for the therapy to have like let me have that confidence because otherwise I think it would be really difficult for me. You ready? Hey. <laughs> you know, start with an easier word. Okay. Yeah, but. Excellent. Ask. Nice smooth talking. Well, it. It. Excellent job. Uh, B4. Try that one again smoothly for me. B4. Josh Holdaway is still undergoing treatment for his stutter. Together with mum Karen, he commits hours of his time each week to oral games and therapies like this one. For wrong. Okay, we'll come back to that one. It's hard to speak to people. Yeah, it gets very annoying. Uh, when you're trying to say something, it gets kind of like stuck. 
if. Good boy. And. Josh was really late. He didn't really start to talk until he was about three, three and a half. He never even really babbled. And it was one of the speech therapists that eventually told us his left um, tongue muscle didn't develop properly. Um, have. Good work. Uh, first. Go, 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 go. No, OK, try that one again. Go. Excellent correcting. I think I get it, um, my, my uh, self-confidence is I just keep trying and I never give up. And I'm very you know, persistent in the way that I do stuff. And I think that like the speech therapy has been helpful, but I, I'd like to know how it happens and maybe one day to get a, a, um, a, 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 a career for it. Alongside dreams of becoming a professional golfer, Josh is also working on his other big hope for the future, a cure for stuttering, by taking part in a groundbreaking new study into the genetics of the condition. Uh, so, I, uh, so what I had to do um, to participate in this study was I had to um, do a survey online and then I got a mailed a package with a tube and you had and basically I had to spit in the tube. Josh's contribution forms a small but vital part of the study which aims to source 3,000 samples of DNA from people who stutter. We understand that stuttering is likely genetic because as many as 70% of people who experience stuttering have a family member who also stutters. 70% is a really high number, so it's really much higher than for many other speech or language disorders that we know. So there's something quite special about the genetic basis of stuttering. Speech pathologist Professor Angela Morgan is part of the Australian team involved in the international study. Around one in ten children experience a stutter in the preschool years, but then luckily around 80% of children will recover either naturally or with therapy. So we hope that for those people for whom current therapies don't work, that the new or novel therapies we would be able to develop will be much more effective. When I came home today, I didn't really know what I would expect after two weeks of my grandma. Josh loves to read and write fiction. He recently delivered his first proper speech to classmates and all the signs suggest he'll be one of the eight in ten children able to fully cure their stutter through hard work and therapy. Oh, he's come such a long way. This is a child that could not say his own name and to give a speech at school, we could not be prouder. But for those who can't be helped by traditional techniques, the gene study offers a source of hope, one that all families affected by a stutter will understand. Any time I see a child that seems to have a stutter or a stammer, all I think about is the way that Daisy's life would be today if she still had that, that symptom. I've never done that before. I put my emotions on a knife's edge. I was crying inside. I... Josh has been through so much with this. There's been the bullying, there's been the tears. So I've seen the negatives, the positives. It's just been, it's been a journey. When people like uh, say negative things about my speech, I get annoyed at them, but then I also explain to them, like, I have I have this speech issue. It's it's just it's not me trying to be funny or anything. It's just me being me. Families keen to take part in the global study can log on to this website. It's easy, and the survey only takes about ten minutes, and it could help lots more kids like Joshua and Daisy. Oh, I just... Those kids are amazing. <laughs> yeah. And don't you think kids' ability to overcome adversity sometimes really is just awe-inspiring and we use the word resilience a lot and kids are incredibly adept at recovering quickly from difficulties. Although I think when it comes to assisting our kids with any kind of challenges they face, whether it be stuttering or I know with my own daughter she's had lots of challenges, as parents often we want to focus on just putting them through and you've got to be happy and you'll be all right and buck up. But I think at the same time we need to acknowledge that it's not realistic to always be happy, that everybody 
everybody goes through ups and downs. And for our kids, sometimes we need to help them understand even what they're feeling. You're so right, Joe. Acknowledging different emotions and teaching our kids how to navigate them is definitely the way to go. And certainly what I strive for with my girls, I'm still striving for that. But you've got to try. It's putting the pieces of the puzzle together with parenting, isn't it? You don't always know if you're getting it right, but I think having a bit of empathy makes a big difference. And from teaching our kids important life skills to nourishing our elders, Maggie Beer is on a cooking crusade to revolutionise aged care menus. That's coming up next on The House of Wellness. Joe, one of my favourite places to visit is South Australia. As you know, I grew up there and my family moved to a place called Roxby Downs, which is almost the middle of Australia. You think about the centre of Australia, Roxby Downs, and my parents ran the pub and the motel up there, so I've got some fond memories of the surrounding community. But I think of three things when I think of South Australia. The beautiful Barossa Valley, mm -hmm. which is incredible. Kangaroo Island, if you haven't been to Kangaroo Island, that is amazing and the national treasure that is Maggie Beer. Oh, she is so amazing, Darcy. I just love her. Her gourmet products are <laughs> divine. And whatever Maggie puts in them not only tastes delicious, but has to be responsible for that beautiful joy, that, that smile that she brings wherever she goes. I want some of that. Since 2014, Maggie has been on a mission to improve the diet and nutrition of older Australians. Aged care has been dominating the news of late. Improving it and restoring the dignity for aged care residents is a big promise of the new federal Labor government. Especially after the 2019 Royal Commission found that many people living in aged care in Australia are actually malnourished. Can you believe that? You can't even believe it. It's absolutely appalling and really hard to fathom that in a developed country like Australia that we care so little for our older citizens, for our, the people in our lives that raised us. You know, other countries revere their older citizens, yet we constantly see and hear about some pretty awful slop that's served in some of these facilities. And everyone, especially the generations that raised us, deserves a nourishing, delicious meal. So cue Maggie to the rescue as she makes it her quest to deliver quality cuisine to all. As we age, it's more important than ever, actually, that our bodies are getting all the goodness and pleasure out of food, that we keep active and involved. And exercise, mental stimulation, connectedness and purpose, they're all part of this recipe. But without good food, I don't believe we can do any of those. So what is Maggie's recipe for a healthy life as we age? Four serves of dairy a day are what the latest research is, and that is to protect ourselves against falls and broken bones. Protein all through the day, not just in one meal. Protein is incredibly important because that looks after the muscle mass, it gives us the energy, and we need the micronutrients from antioxidants. The antioxidants from fresh seasonal vegetables, particularly everything that's red and orange and gold, they are the most important ones, but with the skins on because that's where the nutrient is. Every green that lives in the garden is so important to us. Every day, what my husband and I eat comes from what have we in the garden as our starting point. It's just so easy to grow herbs in a pot. I mean, this is a big pot, but it's still herbs in a pot. If you don't have a garden and you have a limited budget, there are foods that are just so perfect for you just buying from the shop. Chickpeas and lentils, legumes give so much protein, give so much nutrient, and they're so cheap. Out of chickpeas, you can make hummus and you can have some crusty sourdough bread and you've got a really lovely snack. Or you can use chickpeas that are cooked but not pureed with your roasted pumpkin and beetroot and onion, fresh herbs from the garden or just parsley. Parsley has so many antioxidants in it. I mean, this is flat leaf parsley, but um, curly parsley is fine too. It's full of those antioxidants. Flat leaf just has a better, a better flavour. It's so easy when you have good produce that 
is of the season and you're thinking, what is the best ingredient? Although Maggie's passion is for produce, she knows there's more to eating than just nutrition. It is so important to have the scent, the smells of food cooking. As we age, our saliva diminishes. It's just one of the many things that happen with age. And the stimulation of saliva happens from the smells of cooking. So the scent of real food and the way it looks, the way it's presented, and I don't mean fancy and fiddly, I mean just real food that looks lovely on the plate and going to some trouble, setting the table with some flowers, looking out onto a garden. The whole dining experience is all part of this. Pumpkin is one of these beautiful golden vegetables and unless I'm making a pumpkin and goat's cheese tart, for instance, I will cook it with its skin on and the skin has so much goodness in it. I come to this as a cook, not a dietitian or a nutritionist, but what I know is that there is a huge issue of malnutrition in older Australians. And that is because they're not being tempted by the scent of real food and food that has been cooked with love. We have such a responsibility to be able to give good food to those in aged care, but also to carers that are looking after someone in their own home or someone who is alone in their home. Because whereas food is the beginning, that there has to be community, there has to be belonging, there has to be interest and focus, there has to be everything together so everyone can have a good life to the end of their life. It's our responsibility. Maggie's on a mission through her foundation. She's holding workshops on how to cook for the aged, either for seniors at home or in aged care. And she's now released modules online so anyone can access how to make nutrition-packed meals. She is a legend, Maggie Beer. What an amazing person. And everyone has the right to eat well, regardless of their time of life, especially in this country. Up next, Heinze and GQ tell us why we should all be sweet for nature's nectar. It's something I love, Joe. That's honey. Plus, the fitness hack that's got new mums back at the gym with their babies. That's right, after this. What I love about my job, GQ, is sharing healthy food alternatives that don't skimp on flavour. Now, if you're a sweet tooth like me, honey is a fantastic replacement for processed sugar. And one type of honey stands out for our broader health, Heinze, and that is Manuka honey. It's produced by bees who pollinate the flowers of the leptospermum plant native to Australia and New Zealand. Indigenous people from both lands have been using Manuka in traditional medicine for centuries. This is thanks to its powerful antioxidant, antimicrobial and antibacterial properties. This can be attributed to the naturally occurring chemical methylglyoxal or MGO in Manuka honey. This activity is so unique that it needs special verification from the Australian Manuka Honey Association. When looking for Manuka honey, choose an Australian brand with over 140 years expertise in honey, independently tested to guarantee the MGO strength in every pack. And not to get competitive with our friends over the ditch, but with its velvety, creamy texture that is gently whipped, 100% Australian Manuka honey has a lighter, more pleasant taste compared to New Zealand sourced Manuka honey. Australian Manuka honey is my go-to when it comes to supercharging my smoothies. That sounds delicious, but I use it with a slice of lemon and ginger in hot tea as a soothing drink or straight from the spoon. Now, listen, all this talk in honey, it's making me a bit hungry. Just buzz off and make me something, please. Oh, I see what you did there. Buzz off, bees. Is that, you know? Play on words. Yeah, I'm there. I'm with you. I'm liking it. Thank you. I mean, old school humour, yeah, but, but I'm, I'm still I'm there. I'm hungry. I'm, I'm hungry. <laughs> The A to Z of Vitamins is brought to you by Barnes Naturals 100% Australian Active Manuka Honey. Proven antibacterial action may help soothe and repair the body. Nurture yourself with naturally bioactive Australian Manuka Honey. Taste the difference. Oh, those two are joined at the hip. Between the two of them, they've got the honey health tips sorted. 
We all know how great we feel after some kind of physical exercise, Jo. It's not only wakes up the muscles, but for me, it clears the head as well. Oh, absolutely. It's so important as far as getting your heart pumping, your breath in and out of your body. It's so great, that endorphin, mental health, it's all there. When well, new research from the University of Sydney has found that students who exercise during the school day are more likely to achieve higher grades. The research is based on studies of more than a million kids aged 9 to 18 here and internationally. If kids played sports for an average of two hours a week during school hours, their marks were actually better. No real surprise there for me, Joe. I think making kids enter a classroom and sit for extended periods without moving, it's unrealistic to expect they'll be absorbing any kind of information. We know that they just need to move frequently and that certainly is going to help their academics as well. Well, the proof is in the results, Das. Science and maths showed the highest grade improvements in physically active students. Plus, playing sport at school was shown to improve concentration and attention and teach kids problem-solving skills as well. It's why I feel really grateful that our kids are active right from the get-go, not just because sport is something that Beck and I love, but it really does impact every aspect of their life in a positive way. Well, getting started early and staying committed to playing sport is absolutely key, Dars. And you know what? It's never too young to start them on that journey. Every weekday morning, thousands of Aussie families are doing this. Come on, boys! The hectic scramble out the door, the school and daycare drop off, and if you work, the mad dash to the office. It's all part of the deal. But if you're time poor and don't have enough hours in your day to exercise and spend quality time with your baby, there is a way you can do both. All right, girls, are you ready to do a workout? So we're gonna pop babies down, we can pop them on the mats. Fitness instructor Carney Spink reckons she has one of the best jobs going around. I absolutely love teaching these classes. First of all, you get big smiles from mums and babies. <laughs> I occasionally get lots of cuddles as well. Her clients range from newborns to 40-year-olds. And while some days she's competing to be heard... Left arm, right leg. Hold the top, squeeze and lift for four, three, two... This organised chaos is exactly what keeps them coming back for more. We run a 45-minute class. Sometimes we get 20 minutes of work done. It's more important that, um, you know, we're all here for the same reason, just to be... give each other energy, finding new muscles that they haven't found for a little while. And rediscovering some of those muscles takes some serious working out. With the option of bringing your baby on board in a harness or as a baby weight. Baby bonding and bonding with other mums carries as much weight as the workout itself. It's really great to see all of these beautiful women taking time, making time for themselves, their workout, to get their bodies back, but not only that, to work on their mental health, even just to get out the house and meet other mums. It's really important in those first few months of baby's life. Good, so think about that nice straight leg. Keep those hips nice and square. I love to watch the growth of the mums coming from, you know, maybe a bit nervous coming into a class like this and, and not exercising, but helping them building up that confidence as well as their fitness too. And that might be the only time they come out for the day and then having that 45 minutes to themselves. Thighs stay still, you curl it in and out, in and out. Um, after having a baby, you obviously feel different. Everything's changed. Um, your whole world now revolves around a baby, so being able to come to class and do something for yourself is really important, and it's also good for him to be around other babies and all the music and noise and stuff as well. It's such a juggle with kids because you obviously need to go somewhere where they're either looked after and you can exercise or, you know, you feel welcome to bring them along, and not all places, especially fitness places, welcome that. So this is really good because you can literally bring them into the class. They're sort of crawling around. It's a little bit chaotic at times but everyone understands because it's, it's all mums so we all sort of look after each other's babies and try and get a bit of a workout in at the same time so it's good. It makes it so much easier not having to worry about having a sitter or you know finding granny. Um, yeah we can just bring Charlie along and he's happy, happy if he's eating. Option to bring that hand down if you need, option to hold both baby as well as your thighs. All that exercise is hard work and a short play a snooze and some sustenance is just what the baby's ordered. Except for this one. Extend that leg out. You ready for a push-up? 
we're going to take a push up all the way down, kiss the baby, go down, push. And what better incentive to pull off the perfect push up than a smooch with your bub? And then we finish off with a nice little stretch, good drink, and then a play with the baby. <laughs> Great story to share with you both, Jackie and Joe. 28-year-old Benny Scott knew he had to go to rehab for his drug addiction but wouldn't go without his dog. So rather than leaving Frankie behind, Benny is taking them both on a walking trip from Sydney to Darwin using nature and the great Aussie bush to heal him on the way, Joe. And beyond dust, <laughs> after Darwin, he's planning to continue overseas in an effort to raise money and awareness about addiction and recovery. What an amazing thing to do. And the long-term plan is to eventually open a recovery centre, but a pet-friendly recovery centre. Animals definitely allowed. Oh, I love that so much because we know how important the love of an animal is. And I think for people in any kind of mental health challenge, whether it's addiction or otherwise, mm. having a loving animal around you, what a difference that makes. Well, we're all dog lovers here <laughs> in House of Learners, so we know that brilliant connection that you get. And Benny has a way to go, another month or so before he reaches Darwin, but a huge effort. Never underestimate the pet-human connection. Now, Jackie, a couple of things before we go. Indeed, indeed. Just quickly, the flu vax, don't forget to have yours. It is free in most states and territories, and it is also Pride Month, so it's a time to celebrate diversity and true equality, Joe. Oh, yes, as well as reflecting on how far mm. civil rights have come in half a century. Let's end discrimination and violence. What a great message to close on, Joe. That's our show for today. Join me and Gerald Quigley on the House of Honest radio show this Sunday. Thank you very much to Joe and Jackie Felgate, and as always to our great friends at Chemist Warehouse. We'll see you again soon.